truth. So, one plus one is equal to. Now, that is basic, isn't it? So, I must know that before I go to three times three raised to the power three. What is three times three raised to the power three? When I bring in that, then I'm bringing in what? Board mass. What is the full meaning of board mass? The off, is it really off? I heard it's not off. <laughs> it's off. Okay. Facebook family, they are saying it is off. Our Facebook family is not here. They are gone. Or they can hear sound, but they can't hear me. They can't see me. Oh, okay. It's powerful. So we have brackets of division. So you must understand those basics before you get to the point where you now write x plus y, x squared plus y is equal to a, 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 b is order. Uh huh. Bracket order, division, multiplication, addition, and sub subtraction. Our our math teachers didn't help us. They told us that bracket off <laughs> is bracket order is order right order that represents the raised to the power two and all that I guess so today you've learned something about board mass so now when you take the book of Romans it is the first book that deals with foundational truth say foundational truth you know, we have the finished works of Christ. Say finished works of Christ. I'm taking my time to teach you systematically. Then we have what um, people teach as the moral teachings. Now, our standpoint as Christians is from the finished work of Christ. It's not like the political party where they start from where someone has not even started, has not even begun or finished. If you go to a very good country where the government, governance and the, the, the democracy is very strong, what happens is that where one person finishes is where another begins. Isn't it? So you notice that maybe they are finished building a project. They are finished. Then where the next government comes to begin from that particular point. Unlike in our case in Africa where someone will start a project then the person will go and start all over again. I'm going somewhere with the example I'm giving. Because that's what most of us are doing in Christianity. So what happens is that this government came, started foundation, got to lentil level and then when this one also came, instead of continuing from the lentil level and then roofing, they also leave that particular project and now go and start foundation and build to a point and they also leave. Then the next government also comes, goes to build another. Is that what is happening now? Whether you are which whether you are PP, PMP or two T U C or Q R T, it applies to all of you. <laughs> now what some of us are doing in Christianity is that instead of starting from where Christ finished, we are trying to dig our own foundation. There is no way you can have victory in Christ when you don't understand the finished works of Christ. There are, there, you see, everything we are already trying to do in Christianity has already been finished. What we do now as Christians is that we, we try to experience it from that point. So whatever you are going to do, whatever prayer you pray, is not now going to be answered from heaven. It's because the answer already exists. I don't know if how many of you are understanding what I'm saying. In Christianity, we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. victory engage in your own battle 
But when you fight from victory, it means the battle has already been fought. So you are not now going to fight a battle. Battle has already been fought. The battle you are now fighting is... <laughs> The beginning of your battle is where Christ has already ended. So, everything I now do in Christianity requires faith to transport it into my domain. It's just like a government saying they have gone for loan. The money is already there, isn't it? But to assess the money, it requires certain systems and protocols to be followed. So, you confessing that Christ has died for me is not enough. There are certain things you have to do to make it an experience. So, there is something we call theoretical knowledge and experiential knowledge. Knowledge that comes from theory is different from knowledge that comes from experience. So, by theory, everybody knows that one plus one is two. But in experience, it's a total different thing. You can teach a child by words. One plus one. The next thing they will say is two. And you can also bring counters and a mobile phone, two mobile phones, and say, this is one mobile phone, this is another mobile phone. When you put it together, how many is it? They will not know. Because by experience, they have not yet gotten there. So, by theory, Christ has already died for us. But to make it an experience in our domain, we need faith to pull that thing to our realm. So, faith is your reaction to what has been done by Jesus Christ. So, that is why he says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. So now faith. So the Bible says we live by faith. Anybody who does not live by faith now cannot assess what has already been done. And faith is not what you say. Faith is how you respond to what has been done. So your response to what God has already done now becomes faith. My life I live a response to what Christ has done. So I believe, okay, I always keep on using football as an example because that's what you understand. How many of you know Ronaldo, Christian Ronaldo, Messi, uh, who else? Wango. Huh? Hazard. It's not a good name to use. <laughs> Roberto Carlos. Oh, it, the new age won't understand him. Today, Jesus, Omega Nayao, Lukaku. Lukaku. Now, let's take Lionel Messi for Today, Lionel Messi for example. Jesus. Omega Nayao. He's already in the team. I bow before. And he's leaving. Jesus. But before he leaves, he's been declared as is he a world time champion or something? When did he win that one? Five times. Okay, he's a world champion. They claim he was a world champion or is. Now, when he was declared as a world champion. From that era, what, what must he do? He must live as a world champion. So when he's playing football, we don't mark him as an ordinary play, player. Today, because now you are playing Jesus, from the position of a world Every other player can be dribbled. As a man Jesus, play football, Omega Nayao. But if Messi plays football, I worship you today. Jesus. Title of a world champion. Because now you are playing as a world champion. Not to play to become a world champion. You are playing because you are already a world champion. 
in the same way, although it's a weak analysis, when you come into Christianity, we live this life because we are living from the point where Christ has already finished everything. So we live as champions. So there is a lifestyle that is required from champions. So now, when you don't live that lifestyle, it means you don't believe the fact that you are now a champion. So your championship is questionable. So now, the life we now live in Galatians 2.20, we live by the faith of the Son of God. Is someone here? So without faith, you can never live this life. Is someone here? You look lost. So now, when you take the books of Romans, the epistles, it now explains to you what has happened to you. So now when I have this understanding, I now know who I am in Christ, what has happened to me in Christ Jesus. When I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I understand what the miracles Christ came to do. I understand what he came to do. But then when I read the books of Romans, I have the effect of what Christ came to do. Are you here? So now we'll begin our journey from the book of Romans. Is someone in church? You've gone live again? All right. <laughs> Who is playing what music? What music are you playing? You say you are playing some music. You are distracting the teaching. All right. So, the fan. Okay. So, if we can, let's look. Let's look at um, from Romans 8. Romans 8 is one of the best chapters in the whole Bible. I call it the journey of the spiritual man. If you want to understand spirituality and how spiritual you can be, you have to read the book of Romans 8. It begins with no condemnation and then ends with no possibility of separation. Say no condemnation and no possibility of separation. It's not for everybody. The condemnation starts with there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So before you declare I am not condemned, you must first be in Christ Jesus. That is the first condition in Romans 8.1. The second condition, not to be condemned, is he says to them who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So you cannot be walking in the flesh and shouting I am not condemned. Tell your neighbor, neighbor be a person of the spirit. Amazingly, Christians today, we are not people of the spirit, but we always shout, I am not condemned. I think there is a song like that. There is therefore now no condemnation to death. Where well, we quote it easily, forgetting that the Bible says that condemnation is not for those who do not walk after the flesh. You cannot be walking in the flesh and be shouting, I am not condemned. There is, there is a rule. Then in verse 2, it says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So now there are two laws here. Say two laws. So there is a law of sin of death, which simply means that the law of sin that leads to death. So when you sin, you die. It's a law. For the wages of sin is death. It's a law. Now, that law was what was existing before the coming of Christ. Christ introduced another law, a higher law. Is someone in church? Now, in, in physics, when you want to destroy one law, you need a higher law. So there is a law of gravity. What is the law of gravity? What does it state? Whatever goes up must come down. 
to break that law, I need a higher law. The law of what? Aerodynamics. Now, that is the law they use to fly planes, to fly spaceship, to fly things out, to break that law. So in the same way, there was a law that was existing. That when you sin, you die. And the Bible has already declared everybody as sinners. So it means that everybody is meant to die. So how then now do we break this particular law? So Christ now came and paid the penalty of death for everybody. Now before you continue and say that Adam sinned. And why am I suffering for it? Remember that Corona, one person brought it and we are all suffering for it. Are you getting me? So, when it comes to the things of the spirit and the things of life, it is not how innocent you are that delivers you from problems. It is how knowledgeable you are that delivers you from problems. That you are innocent about the fact that there are armed robbers that are killing people will not stop armed robbers from killing you. You need knowledge as to whether there are armed robbers. You know that people who said, me, I'm innocent. I didn't know that this boy would cheat on me. It is not a factor to consider. That you are innocent does not mean that someone will not beat you, someone will not do something to you. <laughs> Innocence never delivers you from problems. What delivers you is knowledge. You need knowledge when you are going to town. That when you meet someone at circle holding a phone, and telling you that, oh, this is just 500 CDs. iPhone, what's the latest iPhone? What? 11 Pro? 11 Pro Max. So it's just 200. I just want to sell it. And you, and you also, out of innocence, say, oh, I've gotten a cheap phone and buy it. It does not deliver you from the consequences. <laughs> <laughs> You come back home singing another song. <laughs> so you need knowledge to tell you that when you get to circle, you see anybody holding a phone and say 200 CDs, don't buy. <laughs> or when you buy, when you get home, it will turn into a bar of soap. Are you here? So, in the same way, we need knowledge. That is why there is teaching. Service. So when Christ came, he came to die. So now, my knowledge of Christ, me knowing Christ, is what has saved me from the law of sin and death. Is someone here? So it is the desire of God that the knowledge of Christ will be made manifest to every human being. And that is what we call salvation and evangelism. Evangelism is just making known Christ or bringing the knowledge of Christ to others. Not making or bringing the knowledge of a church. Are you here? I've gone home. Facebook family, are you there? So the law of the spirit of life. What is the law of the spirit of life? It says that when I follow the spirit, I have life. But when I follow the flesh, I die. Is someone in church? Has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. The Bible never said the law is weak. The Bible says that the law is weak through the flesh. In other words, are you ready for some deep teachings tonight? In other words, the flesh, say the flesh, restricted the potency of the law. Because the law is very powerful. It was very powerful. But then, man is in the flesh and God is in the spirit. How can you please someone that is in the spirit when you are in the flesh? Is someone in church? For you to communicate and have a job with certain government officials, you first have to be in the government or in the party. So God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But here is man. Man is in the flesh. Man is trying to please God in the spirit. The laws 
were in the flesh. Are you here? So, the flesh restricted the potency of the law. The law is spiritual, but the flesh is weak. The flesh is weak. So, it made the law look very weak. So, it restricted the potency of the law. The, str- the strength of the law was weakened by the flesh. Whereas grace was strengthened by the spirit man. The law was weakened by the flesh. Because the flesh is weak. But grace was strengthened because grace is in the spirit. Are you getting me? So it wasn't like the law was weak. But then the man that was to operate under the law was weak. And the law was given to the flesh. So now for God to change that thing, he has to now introduce another element in the spirit called grace. Called the Holy Spirit. Are you in church? Now, the flesh is in sin. Are you taking note at all? This is purely teaching. The flesh is an entity. You can write that down. The flesh is an entity incapable of obeying God because it is a fallen nature. Remember in the garden, what fell? Man fell. What fell? His flesh. And remember God told um, the serpent, that shall you eat all the days of your life. Are you here? Are you here? Now, he told the serpent, that shall you eat all the days of your life. And we know that man was created out of dust. So what does that mean? It means that the enemy's appetite is your flesh. That is the enemy's food. So the enemy gets satisfaction by feeding on your flesh. So anytime I obey the flesh, it brings pleasure to the enemy. Anytime I disobey the flesh, I starve the enemy. So how can this flesh obey God? When this flesh itself is fallen. Are you here? I think you are not understanding the whole thing. So let, let me just end it here. They are not understanding. Facebook family, they are not understanding. So I, I, I will just end it here. <laughs> so Romans 8 now gives us the journey of the spiritual life. So now he brings a contrast. If you read the Bible, there is always a contrast. There were two trees in the garden. The tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was not just physical trees. It represented two different natures. It represented the spiritual life and then the carnal life. At the time we got to the book of Revelation, we had two different women. Who are those two different women? One was called Babylon and the other was called New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem was coming from the skies. What I'm saying is too high for you. Then I have to reduce it to your normal level. Babylon was earthly. Remember Revelation says Babylon the great. So the achievement of Babylon is to be great. Whereas the achievement of the new Jerusalem is to be in the heavens and to be spiritual. This shows the two lives that exist on the earth. There are people who out of carnality just want to be great. And there are people who are like the New Jerusalem. One of the titles given to the New Jerusalem is that it is a holy city. So the chase of the New Jerusalem is holiness. Whereas the chase of Babylon, which represents carnality, is to be great. So there are two worlds. There is a carnal world and a spiritual world. 
So he says in verse 5 in Romans 8 that for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Then verse 6 he says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So we see over here that what produced death in the garden was not just the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it was actually carnality. Because it was not just the tree. It was man trying to satisfy his flesh. Is that man in church? If you read Genesis chapter 3 very well, verse 6, Genesis 3, 6, it says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did it. So it was more about satisfying your flesh rather than obeying God. The spiritual man seeks to obey God. The carnal man seeks to satisfy his flesh. That is the result of the two trees. Ask your neighbor, I use satisfying your flesh or <laughs> you are obeying God. So, the resultant effect of man trying to satisfy his flesh brings death. According to Romans 8. So, to be carnally minded is death. So, carnal mind seek to satisfy their flesh whereas spiritual people seek to what? Obey God. So anytime you are trying to obey God, you are walking in the spirit. But anytime you are satisfying a hunger when you are supposed to be fasting. Anytime you are looking at these three things are what constitute the predicament of man. And this is what befalls every fallen man. There are three things. John captured it very well in 1st John chapter 2 verse 15 and 16. He gives us the full diagnosis of how to avoid falling into the hands of the enemy. In 1st John chapter 2 verse 15 and 16 he says, love not the world that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the father is not in him. Then he continues in verse 16 and says that for all that is in the world he did not say the things in the world he categorizes the whole world into three parts all that is in the world can be divided into three number one let's go the last for all that is in the world the last of the flesh the last of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but of the world so if I want to escape from the sin of loving the world I have to be careful of these three things last of the flesh the things which the flesh desires mention them food food is the number one thing to show your appetite for the things of the world a man who cannot control his eating cannot control his flesh That is why Jesus, to begin his ministry, the first thing he dealt with was his appetite for food. And when the enemy came to tempt him, the first thing he brought was food. Turn these stones into bread. The moment you cannot put away things that satisfy your flesh, know that you are falling a victim. Ask your neighbor, when was the last time you put away food for three days. <laughs> Facebook family, when was the last time you put away food? <laughs> God bless you, Pastor Frederick. Said the name that you That's my cousin. He's also watching us. God bless you so much for watching us. Amen. So now, he now brings us the two natures and this is the whole effect of the as we say the dichotomy of man the, the whole issue of man is the fact that your flesh is wanting satisfaction 
your spirit is seeking to please God. And the person that is suffering is now your mind. So your mind now becomes the battlefield. So once my mind is settled on the flesh, I become carnally minded. Once my mind is settled on the spirit, I become spiritually minded. So the whole thing, if you look at it, if you look at Romans chapter 8, verse 6, it says that for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spirit. So he uses the word minded. So it's more about the mindset. When you put your mind on spiritual things, it means you are spiritually minded. And you become pleasing to God. Was it not in the book of Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 that he says that whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are of a good report, think on these things. So what you think about tells me whether you are carnal or spiritual. Ask your neighbor, what are you thinking about right now? Hey, that question will bring a lot of problems in this room. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the carnal mind is one that chases after the flesh. I want to look good. The last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, the th listen, the eye is not tired of seeing. Isn't it? Your eye, everything you want to see. Can't you see that you, you, you like to see? Last is a craving. An unusual desire for something. Last of the flesh. Every food you want to eat, you are as I'm talking now, some of you are craving for food. want to satisfy the flesh the flesh must be satisfied obey your test sprite <laughs> quench your test then we have the last of the eyes your eyes is not tired of seeing every movie you must see you are craving to see things hey! the things you this your eyes are seen sitting here only God knows. These are your eyes, the things it has seen as you are watching me. Only God knows. <laughs> Tell anybody the things this your eyes have seen. I don't know what you are thinking about, but whatever you are thinking about, that is what you are thinking about. <laughs> so in Philippians 8, he gives us the cure to overcome carnality. So he says that whatsoever things are true. So don't think about things that are false. Because there is a lot of false information out there. So he says whatsoever things are honest. Honesty is different from truthfulness or perfection. The fact that someone is honest does not mean he's perfect. The difference between Joseph and David was that David was an honest man. David, you have sinned. You slept with someone's wife. He goes to God and says, God, it is true. I'm sorry. To the first century Christian, you told a lie. Repent. It is not true. I never lied. <laughs> I was just being smart. To the first century Christian, you call him. Where are you? We can hear car honking. I'm in my room. I'm not feeling well. Sometimes people will be in church. They will call them, where are you? <laughs> I'm in the house. I'm in the house. You are in church. And you are lying in the house of God. So whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So he gives you the things you must think about. So if I were you, when you get home, list out these things and let it be the things I'm going to think about from today. Instead of thinking about that, your broken heart and your girlfriend, boyfriend, think about these things. I'm teaching you how to have 
a correct mentality for a spiritual life. You want to have a spiritual life? Calculate these things and think of it. Are you getting me? Let's go back to the book of Romans. I want us to finish the book of Romans. So now he tells us from verse 14 that for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Let's go to verse 8, please. The carnal mind is enmity against God. So immediately I begin to walk in carnality. You see, when we pray this prayer, let God arise. Go back to verse 7. Lift up your right hand and say, Let God arise. And let his enemies be scattered. Facebook family, pray with me. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let me tell you this thing. The moment you become carnal in your thinking, you are an enemy of God. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. So the next time you pray that prayer, let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. And meanwhile, just some few minutes ago, you were thinking about how you can choose someone's daughter. Remember. Everybody is quiet. You see? You see? <laughs> That's okay, the message. <laughs> God will help us. <laughs> the next time you pray that prayer but meanwhile you have just thought about how you can someone should die or how someone can should just hit someone or how someone who insulted you something bad should happen to him remember can I mind amen for it is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can be so then verse 8 they that are in the flesh cannot please God so this must be your number. Listen, I was talking the other day and I said that favor can be programmed. And people didn't understand. You think that favor just happens. No. There is a routine that brings favor. No matter how gifted you are with football, there is still a routine you must follow if you must become the best player. Isn't it? You can't just go to the team and then Barcelona, they just stand there and you hit the boys' course. No. Do you know the number of times Beckham has to practice before he hits one target? Do you think every ball you just kick will just enter the net? Huh? Just like that. If that was the case, then they wouldn't have scored a particular team 8-2. They would have called them like 20 something. I didn't mention the name of any team anyway. The team that scored them, their, their name also starts with the same letter as their own, isn't it? So it, can, it tells you that we may have the same initials, but we are not the same. <laughs> Some of you are still crying till now. <laughs> wow, we thank God. So you notice that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. It does not end there. If so be. So now he gives you a condition. He says the only reason you are not in the flesh, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So he is now taking us to traces of identifying your carnal, carnal life. So when you walk in the flesh, it's because the spirit of God is not in you. So now you have to know how to know whether the spirit of God is in you or not. Are you here? So you should be asking yourself, ask your neighbor, is the spirit of Christ in you? And how do you know the spirit of Christ is in you? How many of you have insulted anybody this week? See, a lot of hands have gone up. How many of you have told a lie? Hands are up. Were you in the spirit when you told a lie and insulted people? <laughs> so if you are not in the spirit, where were you? <laughs> if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Verse 10. I'm going to answer the question once saved, forever saved. Okay? Oh, you don't want me to answer it today. Okay. 
Now, someone gave <laughs> a very nice analysis that if the devil can deceive Adam to sin and then be judged permanently to death, what makes us think that Christ coming, we receiving Christ, will not make us have life eternally forever? Do you understand the, the statement? You are saying that Adam fell. Satan was able to deceive Adam and Adam received eternal death for life. What makes you think that Christ also, when you receive him, you can also not receive eternal life for life. As you will never be rejected. You can never, your name can never be blotted out. But that is not even the issue. When you bring in such an argument, the next question I will ask you, eh, if you say that Christ, eh, Adam sinned and they had eternal death and then Christ so Christ is greater than the devil so it means that once say forever saved if Christ has saved you it is forever because the enemy brought sin and it was forever isn't it the question I will ask is eh, the question I want to ask is before Adam fell what life did he have do you understand the question because for God to say that when you eat of this tree, you will die, means that Adam had a particular life that will never die. So what life did he carry that made it possible for the devil to deceive him and now he can die? If Adam had a nature that could never have died and yet it was possible for the devil to deceive him, and now he can die. Think about the rest. I'm continue for you. Then let's go back to Romans. <laughs> oh, yeah, but like, they are not understanding. Eh? Adam did not have just a short life. Do you know when Adam was created, he was not created to die? Are you aware? Is it, although the Bible doesn't state it that Adam had eternal life, but we know that he was not going to die. But if he was going to die, then there was no need for God to say the day you eat of this tree, you will die. So if God has now said the day you eat of this tree, you die. And then someone came and then deceived you to eat a tree, that will make you die. Then it means that before that introduction came, I had a particular life that would never die. And that is eternal life. Now, Adam eating of the apple was a form of denouncing the lordship of Jesus Christ for the Lord, the Lord God. You cannot tell me once day forever sin and then you have somebody who denounces Jesus Christ as Lord and still tell me once day forever sin. Because, I hear, this, this is how I see the scriptures. Okay? This is how I see the scriptures. Because if you read the Bible very carefully, if you, if you read the Bible carefully, People make the argument that um, when you are saved, it's eternal. How can God put his life in you and the sin you commit can take him away? No amount of sin you commit eh, can ever take away eternal life from you. True. Because no amount of righteousness you do can ever make you have eternal life. True. But here's the thing. The way you became born again was by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior and believing in your heart. Isn't it? In the same way, the moment you disbelieve that particular condition, the opposite happens to you. So it's not a matter of, I mean, uh, once saved, forever saved. No, that cannot be the statement. That is why you must, that is why the the, 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 the the armor was given. That is why we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Are you getting me? So if I come today and say, I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I was once born again. The devil can, de don't you know the devil is deceiving many people not to accept Jesus Christ again? Not that ever say that 
anybody that really has Christ can never get to the point of denouncing Christ it is not possible then there is no need for fighting the fight of faith then there is no need when the Bible says casting down imaginations because imaginations is what leads to thought and thought is what leads to beliefs and beliefs is what leads to faith and faith is what leads to actions and actions are what leads to failure or success in life so if the enemy brought an imagination to Eve and Adam Adam, for them to eat of the tree to the point where they were falling natures although when they even fall, fell God still loved them and approved them but he said the day you eat of this tree you will die that statement still hangs till today. The day you eat of the tree that the enemy will produce to you. There are a lot of Christians last year, but they are not Christians today. So if you are saying one say forever sin, then it means that those Christians also, those people who have now denounced Christ and say, now I am a Muslim, that means they are also going to heaven. And don't bring the argument and say that, oh, I mean, then they were never born again because if they were really born again, then they would never have deviated from Christ. Then Adam was never the son of God. Because if he was really the son of God, you would not have disobeyed God. You are not a robot. There's someone in church. That is why you must guard your salvation. Guard it. It's a precious thing you must guard. You must, you must consciously make sure. You know, listen, mostly it's a if you knew how precious salvation was you will not just play it like a toy I hear yeah I know this statement I've made people will come at me and say eh, it is a lie once saved forever saved there is nothing you can do that will make God stop loving you go to Romans 8.35 it says what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now go to verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is see that condemned? It is Christ that died. Here rather that is risen again. In other words, the only person who has the right to accuse you is the same person who is your judge. How will you feel when you are going to court and the lawyer that is going with you to the court to go and intercede on your behalf is the judge sitting on the case so Christ is both my advocate and my judge so man doesn't have the capacity to take you to court the devil can take you to spiritual court but your lawyer is also your judge. Is someone in church? Then it continues in verse 34. Who is he that condemned? It is Christ Jesus that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of the Father? Who also maketh intercession for us? So the person who has the right to condemn us is the person who is also interceding for us. So he, out of this understanding. He makes the statement in Romans 8.35. He says, What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. As it is written, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Now, in the list of the things that can separate us from the love of Christ, he states, shall persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. But he never states unbelief. Unbelief can make you be separated from the love of Christ. If you are not careful, people will get to the point you have to balance the gospel that there is no sin that is too heavy for God not to forgive. No sin is thicker than the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus has the capacity to wash every sin. Every sin. 
but then don't also forget that with that same understanding you have to also know that your unbelief of God can cause you separation from God is someone in church so he goes on if you look at it from verse nay in all this is your mother conquerors verse 37 then verse 38 for I am persuaded that neither death nor life have you seen it nor angels nor nor things present nor things to come nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come now have you seen the list he's giving them he's talking about the things that have the capacity to separate us from the love of Christ and he lists these things. He says, For I'm persuaded that neither death, death cannot even separate you from the love of Christ. Death as a Christian brings you closer to God. Because to, for me to lie, to, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul said, To be absent in the body is to be present with Christ. So death can never separate the believer from Christ. It rather brings him closer. The next day you hear, or the next time you hear that a Christian has died, don't cry. Don't mourn. Rejoice. Because a soldier is going to his father. You see, it is with this understanding that we don't mourn the dead because we know they are in a better place. It is with this understanding that a man will see his wife die. I'm talking about a musician in Nigeria. Will see his wife die and still wear white, white, white and come and stand on stage to sing songs. It is not because he didn't love the wife. It's because he has a better understanding of spirituality. Christians today, we lack the understanding of spirituality. So when we go through a little shake-up, we call it disappointment from God. Who told you trials and tribulations are a sign that God is not with you? Did you not read when Jesus said that a servant is not greater than his master? If they persecuted me, they shall also persecute you. Did you not read in Matthew chapter 5 when he said, Blessed are you when men shall persecute you and rival you for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. Did you not read in James when he said count it all joy when you go through diverse temptations did you not read when Peter went to the temple and he went to preach and they cast him into prison and they came out and they said don't speak anymore in that name and Peter said we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard and the council and the people the Pharisees they came together and they gave him some whooping 39 lashes and the Bible says when Peter came out of that place they rejoice for they have they have been counted worthy to suffer for the cause of christ today's christian does not understand the element of suffering in the blessing of god for you to understand the equation of suffering or the blessing of god you have to also understand that one of the major ingredients of blessing is suffering for his name is someone in church so at the end of the day, what you go through does not matter. It is what becomes of you after you have gone through it. So he says, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? What, 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 what has the capacity? You see, this is the revelation Paul had. He got to a point in his life where he realized that I am so much in love with God that I am no longer seeking for material things. To the Christian an opportunity to die is a happy opportunity because it is a moment to meet Christ. Listen, listen, listen. <laughs> when you see someone who is in America and his wife is in Ghana and he's doing everything possible to come to Ghana to meet his wife out of love, the new love. He, he, he went from visa to come to Ghana. They, they bounced him. Then suddenly the American government decides that they are going to deport him. What do you think will be? Will he be sad? 
why should you be sad because this world is deporting you to heaven I am going to a better place tell your neighbor if you hear that I am dead today don't cry you see you, even this day you say hey me die God forbid I will live and not die <laughs> not today not today I refuse it I reject it I refuse it I reject it when you hear that I am dead don't wear black to my funeral <laughs> I hear all of you don't like this statement because Christians nowadays say, ha, we love the flesh so much that we don't like to see pain. But when a woman is going to give birth, nine months, she will go through pain. And someone says something whilst we were in school. He said, an inevitable blow, which is yours, which is eventually yours, earlier encountered saves you from further torrential hostilities. He says, an inevitable blow. Something that is yours is yours. <laughs> One day you will die. So he says, well, I'm persuaded. Paul is not saying that I know. If he had said I know, it's a different... He said, now I have got into the place of full persuasion. Death, life, angels. So Paul is saying that angels can even appear to me. It will never separate me from the love of Christ. For those of you who are willing to see angels, Paul is saying here that angels have the capacity from separating you from the love of Christ. There are people that angels appear to them, and it has become a doctrine. One angel that appeared to you, now you have you have made it a doctrine. Everybody, there are people today who know the names of certain angels. I have not mentioned any name. Not principalities. Not powers. Not things present. Not things to come. May I give you this announcement, breaking news from heaven, that the future carries a lot of pain. The future carries a lot of uncertainties. The future carries a lot of evil winds. But what makes us stand sure is in this verse that this thing cannot separate us from the love of Christ. True test of love is when the wind blows but it stands. When persecution arises but it stands. When death looms but it still fights through death. When life still tries to corrode that love relationship as acid but it still fights over it because love is stronger than death if love is stronger than death it is stronger than life <laughs> should I explain <laughs> in Sons of Solomon he says something he says many waters cannot quench love so Paul just explained what so Solomon was saying Sons of Solomon chapter 8 verse 6. Let me close. Let me close. You look lost. You are all that matters. You are all that matters. Put you in front. In front of my man. You are all that matters. You are all that matters. I'll make room for two You and I, Jesus You are all the mothers You are all the mothers Oh, hey, oh hey. You are all the mothers Oh, hey, oh hey. You are all the mothers Look at this. He says, set me as a seal upon thy heart, as a seal upon thy arm. For love is what? Jealousy is cruel as the grave. 
when you see someone who is walking in jealousy it is equal to the grave <laughs> is someone in church I, I didn't write the bible he says love when you see people in love the strength of love is like death that is why when you break someone who is in love the end result can lead to death the end result of Christ's love for us ended in death. You see, sometimes when we are celebrating Easter, you see people crying seeing Jesus die. No, 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 no. It is not a sad story. It is a heroic story. How our husband, our king of kings, our conqueror, the king that rules over the universe, conquered death and gave us the keys it's a love story about how love conquered the grave the next time you are watching Easter story about Jesus dying on the cross don't be crying cry because of the, the depth of, of his service to make sure you are saved but don't cry and say they are killing him they killed him by resurrected the gospel does not end at the cross Remember, after the cross is resurrection. See, after the cross is resurrection. I have a book called Before the Cross. And I have a book I want to write also titled After the Cross. <laughs> Before the cross is pain. After the cross is resurrection. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. When I carry my cross remember that Jesus did not stay on the cross. He came down, went to the grave and resurrected again. When I carry my cross, after the cross is glory. So he says, look at this verse 7, then I'll teach you something he said, the light affliction. I'm just ending with the book of Romans 8, the, book, the chapter of Romans 8. The rest is easy to understand. Says many waters. Say many waters cannot quench love. So it means love is like a fire that cannot be quenched. If you really love God, nothing should be able to quench your love for God. Jobs will come, but jobs should not quench your love for God. Boyfriend, girlfriend will come. I should not quench your love. What will you do if the person you love and you want to marry says today that I'm no longer going to attend this church again. I've stopped going to church. I don't want to go to church. Will you follow her or him? You can't answer the question. <laughs> Some of you will follow. You follow your heart, but you never follow God. Christians today will follow their hearts. They will do everything possible to make somebody they know very well does not fit into the programming of God, fit in by force. They will bring somebody and say, oh, you know, he, he, he doesn't go to church, but he, he used to go, but just that now he's busy. The truth of the matter is that the person doesn't go. You are trying to make excuse to justify your your love for the person but it is not strong enough your decision should marry, to marry should be purely based on the fact that God has accepted this person the church is quiet they don't, they don't, accept, they don't want to hear what I'm saying many water you see people when they are in love eh? Eh? never ever in your lifetime this is an advice from a counselor. Never ever in your lifetime try to take the side of two people in love who are fighting. Don't take the side of any of them. Are you getting me? Two people fighting who are in love that you know. Never in your life tell the one person when it comes to this one that is like, oh, don't mind, she's foolish. Hey, you have just dug your own grave. After they resolve the matter, <laughs> you will not be the third person, you will be the enemy. <laughs> yeah, 
let two people be fighting. And then you go and you say, I dare you to how can you be talking to your husband like that? Shut up. Don't you have my keep quiet? Sit down. When they finish everything, the husband will go and tell the wife, but this guy, what is the meaning of that? Why? Is he a fool? Me, I don't like him, crowd. But meanwhile, this is the same person who came to resolve the matter. <laughs> is someone in church? If you see, if you know any lover by you, as I say, what he say, is it true? <laughs> Many waters cannot quench love. Many waters could not quench the love God has for us. And this is one of the verses people used to say, once saved, forever saved. But you have to also understand that God died for everybody. But not everybody will go to heaven because not everybody has accepted Christ. But he loves the whole world. So although his love is strong, but there are principles that you don't follow. It's just like, it's just like the prodigal son. So far as the prodigal son went away from his father, he was not in the house. <laughs> Someone said that even the prodigal son was still the son of his father. He was still the son of his father, but he went away. Until he took the decision to return, the father would never have opened his arms to come for him. The father was always standing there waiting for him. The father was not in the house. The father was standing outside in the field waiting for him to come. But the father was not the one who went to bring him. That you were once a son does not mean that when you go, the father is the one who come and chase you. No, 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 no. Are you here? So next time people are talking, explain to them that, listen, although God's love is strong, it does not justify your foolishness. Eh? Say, although God's love is strong, it does not justify my... All right. Wow. The next time you see a young lady and a young guy in love and they come and they say certain things, you know, I don't know why she's behaving like that. There you too. Instead of being smart, say, oh, don't worry. You know, let's pray. Let God's will be done. These are the general advices you give. Listen, I'm teaching you a principle in life. If you don't want to be disgraced in this life, follow what I'm telling you. There you too. You say, you know, Mikra, I've been wondering if she's the will of God for you. <laughs> You have just dug your own grave. You've, you've bought your own coffin. Do you know what you go and say? After everything, you, you know, that man, he doesn't like you. He doesn't like you. Look at what he said about you. So when they come with the issue, say, oh, really? So what do we do now? Let us pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. It will work, okay? let the will of God be done don't ever God will give us grace <laughs> so love is strong what can separate us from love God's love God's love is so strong do you think God love enough he loved you enough to die on the cross for you. And he doesn't love you enough to preserve you from the attacks of the enemy. What are you saying? He loves me enough to die on the cross for me. But he doesn't love me enough to stop the enemy from killing me. If I die today, it's because God has allowed it. God will bless us. Let me just close. God will bless you. He will keep you. He will preserve you. Don't be afraid of anything. Are you getting me? I said, well, don't be afraid. With these foundations I've given you, when you are walking, walk in proud. You see, don't have a, a high self-esteem. No. Have a high Christ esteem. In Christianity, there is nothing like self. Everything is about Christ. So my boasting is in Christ. 
we make we make our posting in, in the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, Do you know who you are talking to? I am nobody, but I am the daughter of the king of kings. This should be your boasting. When you wake up in the morning, Christ in me, the hope of glory. What does it mean? It means once Christ is in me, I still have hope. Sometimes it looks like there is no hope. How many of you have been there before? Sometimes when you wake up, it looks like things will not be answered. Then suddenly, in the same day, God will use about five people to bless you with money. And you ask yourself, where have all these five people been? Why didn't one bring it last week? Or the other one bring it last two weeks? But he wait and he accumulate everything and give to you. When God wants to embarrass you with blessings, I tell you, you'll be shy. May God surprise you in the month of September. I said, may God surprise you in the month of September. May he open supernatural doors for you. Doors that no one can close. I prophesy over your life that although you have been through many tribulations and many tears and you shed many tears, Romans 8, 18 is what I prophesy over your life. Our light affliction the sufferings of this present time Romans 8 18 are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us whatever you have been through listen to me whatever you have been through eh, it is God packaging everything together for you the Bible says if the princes of this world had known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory if the enemy had known that bringing that broken heart your way is going to open doors that will make you become a great woman of God and a great man of God one day. He would not have tried. If the enemy had known that stopping you from having certain amount of money will make you become a feeder of the poor because now you understand what it means not to have money. He would never have tried. Out of something bitter something sweet that is the wisdom that is the quote uh, Samson said <laughs> I'm, I'm prophesying Samson was going with his father father and mother and the Bible says he met a lion and he killed the lion when he went into the land of Philistines and came back the Bible says the lion the jaws of the lion the carcass a smelling part of the lion there was honey in it now the question is out of all the nice places in this universe the bees could not find any place to produce honey than to find a rotten animal I thought bees produce a, a honey in the trees we call it honeycomb isn't it but they came to produce the honey well in the carcass you know a carcass carcass is what rotten animal, dead animal. It is rotten. The jaw. And honey was found in the rottenness. <laughs> in your brokenness, light shall appear. In your pain, prosperity shall abound. In sickness, breakthrough shall spring forth. In your darkness, peace shall arise. In your tears, ministry shall break forth something sweet out of something bitter something sweet out of something bitter who would have thought that the king of kings would be born in a manger I'm prophesying to your life that the month of September God is going to surprise you with strange things because some of you have been through pain you have been through bitter experiences and God is saying the year 2020, although it has been a bitter year, it's also going to be a year you are going to experience the glory of God. Amen. The year is not over. September is the beginning of the year. This year began this month. Is someone in church? To get ready for it. 
out of a broken life. Haven't you seen that mostly the rich people here, majority of them, they came out of very bad experiences. <laughs> it's as though God intentionally allows their bad experiences to be the platform upon which he will bless you. Do you know why? Because when you go through bad experiences, you are broken. You are shattered. And the Bible says the Lord is close and nigh to them who have a broken and a contrite spirit. It is only those who have been through broken things that have the grace to be humble. People who have a lot of things on their shoulders mostly become proud because they think it's by their own gain. But people who have been through a lot know what it takes to survive. They know what it takes to survive waking up in the day and looking on your left side of the bed, looking on the right side of the bed and all you can see are bills to pay and there is no money to pay it. They know how it feels like to walk for miles without getting money to take transportation but they still have to walk because they have to get home. They know how it feels like to wake up in the morning and there is no money to eat and throughout for two days they have not eaten and they even need water to cool themselves but there is nothing. They know how it feels for them to wear dress and the dress is patched under and yes, they have to wait and go somewhere. They know how it feels. So it makes them humble when God elevates them. And humility attracts the grace of God. Humility is a magnet that pulls the grace of God to you. And one of the ways you become humble is through the things you have been through. Never be ashamed of the things you've been through because it's part of your story. Tell your neighbor it's part of your story. Yeah. Sometimes we are afraid to tell our stories because it's too shameful. Sometimes we feel when we say this part of our story, it makes us look very nasty to people. But do you know what? It is the nastiness that shows how much human you are. You are not an angel. You don't have a perfect life. And you will never have a perfect life. The day you have a perfect life, you cease to exist on this earth. The pain you went through is also part of your story. The brokenness you went through is also part of your story. So you know what? If you once used to sell charcoal, write it as part of your CV. Because it is all this that gives you a working experience in the things of the spirit. Am I talking to somebody? May God help us. That's why we sing those songs. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day. That is your story. She does it. That is your story. Don't be ashamed. Listen. I'm coming. Don't be ashamed to tell people where you used to sleep. Don't be ashamed to tell people the type of people that ever you met in your life. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed to tell people the times you didn't have money to eat, the things you had to eat. Don't be ashamed to tell people where you have come from. Don't be ashamed to tell people how you have been embarrassed before. Don't be ashamed to tell people of how ugly you used to look because there was no money to keep yourself. Don't be ashamed to tell people of the many times that people have insulted you because they did not understand you. Don't be ashamed to tell people of your past because the past is also part of the future. If you understand that statement, <laughs> the past is also part of the future. One day when you stand to tell your story, it is not how eloquent you are that would, that would, that would amaze people. It is where you came from that will amaze people. Someone in church say it's also part of my story. David was not afraid to tell of his story that I was once a keeper of the sheep but today I am a king of Israel. When Melchior told David, why, why are you dishonoring yourself in the sight of this? We said, maybe you don't know my story. 
Because when you know where I have come from, you understand why I praise God the way I do. Sometimes when you see people, you think that everything has been rosy. I don't know why God will suddenly shift the message to this point. But it's to encourage somebody, to tell somebody that whatever you have been through is still part of you. Once you didn't die, it is your scar. And it is your scars that make you a star. Don't be ashamed. Some of you guys, you want to have a perfect look. So when you meet someone, you don't want to tell us how bad you were. When, we, when you tell us how bad you were, we know how far God has brought you. Don't be ashamed of your story. Don't be ashamed of telling people where you come from. <laughs> I come from Mafi, Boglikov, and that is where I come from. It is part of my story. Sometimes, you see, never ever associate with people who have an innocent life. Because nobody has an innocent life. It is a, a form of pretense. I rather value somebody who tells me of the deep things they have done before. I will appreciate him. It makes me appreciate how far you have come. When you know how far somebody has come, you appreciate their little progress. You don't know. You don't know the story. It is time to get off that pretense in church where we come to church and appear as angels and appear as people who have never been disappointed before as people who have never sinned before as people who have been holy all their life as people who have never suffered anything before sometimes people dress as rich men but they are broke in their pockets it's part of the story sometimes people have used all kinds of things just to keep up appearances but you don't know there have been times that I was wearing only one suit, but I had five different ties. <laughs> it's part of the story. And you must also say this part of the story one day. Because one day when you appear before God, it is not, it is not your success that will be counted. It is the things you have overcome. And they overcame him by the blood, by the word of your testimony. Don't be shy to tell people that I was once a bad boy, but I'm trying to be a good boy now. Don't be ashamed to tell people that once a point in time, I was a very wicked person, but now by the grace of God, I'm trying to be a better person. Do you know what? Because when I talk that way, it is not a proud statement. It is appreciating the goodness of God. If it had not been for God on our side, where would we have been? Sometimes we are afraid to tell our story. We want to appear as angels. Forgetting that angels live in heaven. Humans live on earth. So far as you live on this earth, you are a human being. Don't be afraid. That was, that was the story of Joseph. When Joseph was in prison, they said, <laughs> the guy said, when I leave here, I'll remember you. The Bible says the guy didn't remember Joseph. Joseph was in a hurry to go back to his father. But God was in a hurry to make him a prime minister in the land of Egypt. Don't be in a hurry to leave your prison. Your prison is also a place you move to your palace. Sometimes we are shy of the prison. Sometimes we are shy of the prison because we think when we tell people we have been in the prison, everybody will say, you too, you have been in the prison. Because when you look at a prime minister like Joseph saying that I have been in the prison, it sounds ridiculous. But let me tell you something. Kings are not just born. Sometimes kings are made. And the process of making kings by God is different from the process of making kings by men. When God is raising up kings, he trains them in the wilderness. The wilderness is a place where kings are made. The last time I checked, the greatest king that ever lived in the history of Israel was born and as the last born of his, his father's children. But he was raised up as a king in the wilderness. He was looking after sheep. Not knowing that the looking after sheep was a rehearsal house for looking after God's sheep, the nation of Israel. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed if, if, if your father is no more, your mother is no more. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of whatever your father or mother is. It is part of your story. When I look at you, 
you become a wonder because of the things you've been through but if you tell me my father never went to school my mother never went to school they don't have anything my mother sells taco but i look at you you have two cars i look at you and say you are a wonder i look at you and say the god that you serve is a great god when the king of egypt looked at joseph he said to whom shall we bequeath this honor than joseph when the brothers came and they told him you are going back to our father he said go and tell my father the things have been true in Egypt go and tell my father that when I came to Egypt I was trying to do good to somebody and the woman paid me back with evil go and tell my father that I used my gift to help someone out of prison but they never remembered me in times of life and in the seasons of life there will be times when you use your all to help others but they will never remember you don't be afraid when people don't remember you it is part of life there will be times you do good for people they will never remember you in my short life as a pastor many times people have forgotten me but that is not my issue I take, I take joy in the fact that I was used as a vessel to help somebody that is my joy whether you remember me or you never remember me is not a problem whether you come back to say thank you or not is not my problem at the end of the day God has used me to bless your life that's what matters to me someone in church never be afraid of your story maybe that can be the message for tonight don't be afraid don't be afraid See, don't, say, don't be afraid of your story once you're a drunkard and so what <laughs> the drunkard is now an usher in the house of God that is the glory don't be afraid to say that once I, 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 I used to steal money from people but now I stand in the house of God don't be ashamed don't be ashamed of your story this is your story tell your neighbor this is your story this is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day this is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the long this is my story this is my song praising my Savior shout this is my story some of you cannot tell your story do you know why because you see this man standing in front of you is not a perfect man and I, I'm not shy to tell you that I'm not a perfect man the person sitting by you is also not perfect <laughs> look around if you see any angel here Tell your neighbor, angels are in heaven. Humans are on earth. If you understand that statement, that is it. Maybe you can write it on your status phone. You don't understand the depth of that statement. The moment you see an angel, you are not on the earth again. You are in heaven. And who is a human being? Job 14, man that is born of a woman is but a few days and full of trouble. The moment there are no more troubles in your life there are no more weaknesses in your life you are no longer a human being you are an angel and can i suggest to you that you are not needed on the earth this is no way to suggest to you that go and continue certain things no i'm just trying to tell you that no matter what you have been through in this life this is what makes us human and this is what makes you strong Give me Job chapter 14 verse 1. 
See, angels are in heaven. Humans are on earth. You see someone say, baby, you are my angel. In the moment you say that, she's no more. Yeah, she's, she's gone. <laughs> Can you see it? Man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. Even Jesus was born of a woman. His days were few. <laughs> Jesus had to fulfill the scripture. Man that is born of a woman. So far as it is a woman that gave birth to you and not a man. The day you see a man giving birth to a human being, they know that this thing, this scripture will not apply. But so far as who women are the one who give birth then it means that anybody that comes out of the womb of a woman this thing will happen to them next verse he cometh forth like a flower and is cut down he fled also as a shadow and continued not so far as you are a man born of a woman your days will be full of trouble when you saw one issue, another issue. Today, they came to do some work in my house. When they finished their work, and the people left the house like this, by the time my wife got to the kitchen, another problem was in the kitchen. We said, it looks like the problems in this house, it will never finish. <laughs> hey, if you like get a house full of AC, you will still have a problem. Get a house made with gold, you still have a problem. May God help us in Jesus' name. Amen. It is well. Take out your offering. <laughs> this is your story. Angels are in heaven, but humans are on earth. Amen. It is well with our soul. Listen, there are days you feel like crying. Cry. Are you hearing? There are days you feel like crying. There are days you will cry. Hey. One of the signs that you are a man is not the ability not to cry. <laughs> In the local palace, they say, Bear me suba. The Bible says, And Jesus wept. Jesus was a man, but he cried. Men also cry. Tell your neighbor, men also cry. <laughs> uh, everybody is quiet. They don't like what I'm saying. Hallelujah. Take out your offering and tithe. If your tithe is here, please come forward. Let's prove it still there okay it's powerful father we thank you for this offering we soak it in the blood in jesus name amen god bless all the people who have joined us on facebook we are very much elated to see all of you god richly bless you i can see all of you over there I can see all of you I can see you pastor that you I can see you. I can see Chumwa AC. God bless you. Hagar Quartin. God bless you. Adams Emma. God bless you. Nana Ama AJ. God bless you. Jack AN. Mr. Jack, watching all the way from America. God bless you. Yeah, I can see all of you. God bless all of you. Amen. Amen. So.